I believe we're live. Let me see if we're live. I think we're live. We should be live. Uh, we're not live just yet on YouTube. Hmm. Okay. Here we go. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh oh, not that. No. Okay. We are live. Sorry for the technical uh, confusion here, but we got it together. I'm Brett Premack, and I want to welcome you to another edition of Jazz Video Guy Live. Uh, today's show will be about a very unique uh, musician and a very wonderful, fascinating man named Phil Woods. Phil, a uh, great alto player uh, for many years, and... Uh, <coughs> Near the end of his life, he started to write an autobiography. And I uh, got some extra noise here. Let me see if I can cut that down. Uh, toward the end of his, pardon me. Towards the end of his life, he started to write an autobiography. And <coughs> the eminent jazz writer and historian, Ted Pankin. And Ted uh, kind of got together. And Ted helped him with the autobiography, editing, doing some writing. And that book is now out. It's called The Life in E-Flat. And today, uh, in addition to having Ted on the show, I'm going to be joined by Phil's longtime drummer, a gentleman named Bill Goodwin. Bill uh, has a distinguished resume. We'll talk about that later. He also served as a, a producer on uh, many of uh, Phil's recordings for a number of years here. Let me pull this guy out of here. Okay, uh, but before we start the show, uh, we're going to look at a little bit of Phil Woods. Uh, in case those of you uh, who are watching the show aren't familiar with him. Uh, we're going to look at him and, and his band. You're going to see Bill Goodwin on drums. So let's take a look at that. And we'll be back in about 10 minutes with uh, Bill Goodwin and Ted Pankin and I talking about the great Phil Woods.
Yeah. Welcome, everyone. <clears throat> Bill, you're off to the side. Oh, I'm trying to get, I see it's the reverse for me, so I'm trying to find, find there I am. Yeah. So what's left of me. Okay, if you could just stay in one place, that would be good, Bill. Okay, well, I'm trying to we'll figure out the right. formula here. You're good, you're good. That's, that's perfect right there. Okay, so we have uh, on the left, on screen left, we have the great Bill Goodwin, who you just heard a little taste of there with Phil's quintet, which featured uh, Tom Harrell and Hal Galper and Steve Gilmore. And that's, the, yeah, Steve Gilmore. And on the right here, we have Ted Pankin, who is a writer, a broadcaster, a jazz historian, a landlord, a father, uh, uh, many, many things. So, uh, shaking his head. Nice to be here. <laughs> okay. So, guys, on this show, we take a lot of questions and comments from viewers, and they've already started to come in. And let's let's talk about the first one here. Richard Norfleet says, "Love Phil Woods. He was quite the character as well." Now, those who know Phil from his music know him to be a, a really excellent musician, but many people don't know Phil Woods the guy. Is it is it right, Ted, to call to call Phil Woods a character of sorts? Well, he had a lot of character and many and was a many faceted character. But I, I I I would say Bill would be better positioned to uh, talk about Phil's character than I. I I. I talked to Phil a number of times, and of course I lived with him uh, vicariously and absorbing and putting together this manuscript, both while during the last four years of his life and in, uh, you know, four or five years after his death, that's um, led to the publication of, Life, of um, Life in E Flat, which is published by Symbol Press, symbol as in the ride symbol, uh, yeah. that sort of symbol. Um, but yes, he was. He 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 was a he. He had a large personality, and he did many many things well. He um, uh, so yes. I, so I guess it's fair to say he was a character. What say you, Bill? Uh, yes, definitely. Uh, you know, uh, Phil had this uh, kind of amazing uh, uh, presence, charisma. I don't know what you you know what you call that exactly, but he he was like uh, you know if there wouldn't have been a Phil Woods, uh, somebody would have had to make one up. You know, so I say in that in that sense, he could have been a, you know a character in a you know in a a play or a, you know a movie, and it would and you know just the way he was, extremely well read, uh, individual. Uh, he was a great cook. He wasn't good at cleanup, but the cooking was very good. And uh, and uh, very well, you know, well read, uh, versed, uh, you know, his musicianship, his flawless musicianship, uh, you know, and a great example to to all of us and those of us who played with him, of course, you know, uh, were were subject to that. He he elevated our 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 game, you know, tremendously. Yeah. So as a yeah, definitely a, definitely a character. I see he had he was both a character and he had character as well. Now we have we have viewers from all over the world today. We have Istanbul, Tel, Tel Aviv, uh, Mexico, uh, and Hong Kong. And a viewer in Hong Kong, the Miners, I have no idea what that name might mean, said, "How would you describe Phil's sound, Ted? Could you say something about the way Phil played?" I, the, of course, Charlie well, Parker so comes. Go ahead. He was full-bodied. He had a huge sound. I mean, everybody who played with him, even Phil, Phil developed um, emphysema around 2001. Bill, is that about right? And um, yeah, yeah. And, and, he, and he had to make he, some adjustments to his style because he couldn't play fra uh, long phrases as he had earlier in his career. But he adapted uh, marvelously, and he had an enormous sound. You could hear him fill a room without a microphone. And he had to use an, an oxygenator, you know, which he carried with him on the road to, um, to function, really. Um, but apart from that, he, he just had, had, had an enormous 
like a Reed Alto sound, but uh, an extraordinary improviser as well. So he, he, I think it was a very malleable human sound, very passionate sound, a lot of vibrations to it. I, I mean, I, I would love to hear some saxophonists out there co comment uh, verbally and, and in messages to you on how they see his sound. Um, but the people who played with him, particularly when he was older, just marveled at his ability to project Given the phys given his visibility that he dealt with for the last fifteen years of his life, yeah. Bill, when did you first hear Phil live? Hear him live? I heard him uh, live at uh, the Newport Jazz Festival in nineteen sixty nine, the European Rhythm Machine. But you know, I, I've been listening to Phil on record since I was a teenager. He was. In my uh, in my young gr group of young musicians in, around Los Angeles, where I grew up and started my career, he was one of our favorite. Uh, we had our our favorite musicians that we really followed closely, and Phil was one of those guys from very early on. It was like Phil, Sonny Rollins, Bill Evans, Tommy Flanagan. You know, the list goes on and on. But uh, we were we were very very much purists. We were very much interested in a certain quality, you know, coming out of the, you know, Bird and Dizzy and, you know, the, uh, what was, you know, the modern jazz of the 50s. And Phil was, uh, as soon as he started making records, you know, he was great. So I had uh, admired him for a long time. And then I saw him play in person, uh, you know, at Newport. I was there with, probably with Gary Burton, because I was in that group at that, that year. And Phil played with the Rhythm Machine with the, uh, uh, George Gruntz and Henri Texier and Danielle Humer. And uh, it was a great, a great group. I enjoyed it very much. And I stood right next to Phil backstage, but I didn't meet him. Huh. And when did you meet him? I met him when he came to my house in, uh, in uh, Mount Bethel, Pennsylvania, at the end of 1973. And under what circumstances did he come to your house? Well, he was uh, traveling... Uh, with my sister, who was his girlfriend at that time. Eventually, they got married. So, uh, Jill, uh, Jill and Phil, my sister Jill, uh, drove cross country with Phil. I, know you t I just read the part of the book where uh, Neil Tesser tells that story that I told to him. Uh, I love when I was a man. I'm glad that Ted that you used the stuff that Neil wrote because I thought it was really good. You did a good job on that. But uh, you know. My sister called me, said she was thinking of uh, relocating to the East Coast, but in any case was going to be traveling through. And she kept mentioning some guy named Phil. You know, was going to fill this and fill that, and this Phil guy is going to do this. And I said, well, so who's Phil? You know, of course, you can come and stay at my house, but who's Phil? She says, Phil Woods. Phil Woods is your boyfriend? No kidding. You know, <laughs> it's like, wow. And I thought to myself, well, you know, she said, you know, can we stay at your place? I said, sure. So I figured, you know, Phil Wiz is coming to my house and uh, we'll play together. Maybe we'll do some gigs. And, you know, and that was, you know, kind of what happened. Yeah. We're having some technical problems, Bill. Uh, your, your image is getting frozen a lot. I think what we'll do is um, I will uh, disconnect you if you can reconnect Perhaps that will include the that will improve the quality of your transmission. So I'm going to turn you off. Just click the link and come right back in. And uh, in the meantime, uh, let me ask Ted: Do you think Phil was uh, heavily influenced by Charlie Parker? Ted, you're muted. Whoops, hold on. Ted, Ted, I'm sorry, I missed you. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, Phil absolutely was influenced by Charlie Parker, um, and um, he discusses he had a a, a meta relationship with Bird. Um, he was influenced by Bird, Charlie Parker, from the age of I don't know, fourteen. Phil was born in nineteen thirty one, so when he first heard Coco, and now's the time that year. I don't know if he heard Red Cross or not, but in any event, he was influenced and. Um, and he fell under his spell. Prior to that, he was a devotee of Benny Carter and Johnny Hodges. And he had a wonderful teacher, actually, who um, gave him um, uh, repertoire 
uh, Johnny Hodges features with the Ellington band for him to listen to. And, you know, he studied Benny Carter charts, but Bird took him over. Uh, he, he grew up in Springfield, Massachusetts, and he was very close to a piano player a few years his senior uh, named Hal Stera, who became a well-known arranger in New York. Some of the, some of the other uh, so some of the other people he came up with were Joe Morello, uh, South, uh, El Salvador, people like this. So a lot of talent in Springfield. In any event, Hal Serra, and he, uh, in 1947, after high school, started taking the bus to New York every couple of weeks to study with Lenny Tristano. For a couple of lessons, Tristano invited him to, I think, the Three Deuces, where he was playing on a... Uh, on a gig, uh, and Charlie Parker was also on the bill as things went on 52nd Street at the time. If you can imagine Lenny Tristano and, and Bird on the same bill, but those things happened then. And uh, Tristano brought him backstage after his set, and there was Charlie Parker. And Phil told this story thousands of times, uh, although a little differently every time. Parker was back there with a cherry pie, a big piece of cherry pie, and he offered him a slice of cherry pie. I don't know if this story is apocryphal or true, but anyway, um, that he, so he, yes, he was he he was he was totally engaged in bird, like uh, one of your listeners said. Everybody from that generation was um, was engaged in Charlie Parker. He um, and you know and he got to know him a little bit as he he went to Juilliard. He 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 graduate. He, he didn't graduate from Juilliard, but he did a full course load. Uh, he uh, writes quite a bit in the book about his experiences at Juilliard. And, uh, and then he was a working musician in New York for a while. And he has a story. He was, uh, for a while, about a year, uh, playing um, for strippers at a club in New York, might, might know as The Garage. It was 99 7th Avenue South. Before that, it was, uh, it, it was called The Nut Club. And uh, it, was a, it was a stripper joint by the time he was there. And he, um, you know, Gil Evans, uh, John, I think John, I think the people he played with there were some of the personnel on his first album, John Erdley, maybe on trumpet. Gil Evans sometimes came and sat in on, on piano. And um, around the corner was a place called Arthur's Tavern on Grove Street, which is still extant. Randy Weston did his first gig there, for example. And Bird and Bird and Bird uh, was playing there, and Bird came over to a saxophone play. I guess his, his saxophone was at Hawk. Bird was living at the time on Barrow Street. This was lit, fairly late in Bird's life. And, um, and Phil had been crying the blues to himself about all the problems he had. Uh, he, uh, uh, you know, his mouthpiece was bad. He didn't like his horn, this, that, and the other thing. And he heard Charlie Parker just go to town on his horn. I mean, just play, you know, at Bird at his finest. And he said he never felt sorry for himself after that. After Charlie Parker died, a couple of years after he died, uh, Bird, uh, 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 Phil, uh, met uh, Chan, Chan Parker, the former Chan Richardson, who had been, um, who had uh, been, I guess, Bird's common law wife. Uh, and the mother of his of several of his children, and um, they hit it off, and they had and they became a couple, and they um, and 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 then were married uh, for I guess you know, together for about 15 years until 1972 or 1973. So Phil also raised um, was the stepfather to uh, several of Charlie Parker's children. So he had a multi-dimensional. And complicated relationship with with Charlie Parker. Yes, um, as many uh, people uh, did. As many people did, but Phil and uh, maybe uh, maybe even a little more multidimensional than most for the some of the reasons that I've stated. Okay, let's see if we can get Bill back here. Bill, can you hear me? Yes. All right. Good to see your face in the place, and your connection has been fixed. <laughs> Let me just. Uh, I'm like you wait, sit still. Let me just line you up, baby. Come on. Uh, okay. Okay. Here you are. Perfect. That's what my mother oh, used okay. to say to me. Oh, yeah? So uh, <laughs> we're here today. Once again, we're talking about this great book, uh, Life in E-Flat, the autobiography of Phil Woods. Uh, on this page, there's a link to purchase the uh, book, uh, which has been receiving nothing but uh, rave reviews from everybody who's read it, uh, which is not surprising. 
And uh, Gary Stager, I believe he's the publisher of the book, right, Ted? S Symbol Press. Symbol. Symbol, Symbol Press. -M -B -A Press. Symbol G Press. Gary makes a comment that uh, Benny Carter was a lifelong influence on Phil Wood. So in addition to Bird, Ted was uh, uh, Benny Carter, one of uh, uh, Phil's mentors? Totally. And early on, I think I may have said this, um, Phil was a uh, devotee of Benny Carter at an early age, from 12 or 13. His, his teacher in Springfield, um, I, I, you know, I'm blanking, I'm having a senior moment and blanking on his last name. Harvey, his first name was Harvey. Harvey LaRose. Harvey LaRose uh, gave him, Phil like an incredible mentorship, uh, taught him all the instruments, taught him proper technique, uh, and gave, and also I, I, he had his first arranging um, experiences with him, and he was very much into Benny Carter's arrangements and big band albums in the uh, you know, circa 1943, 44, and he'd listened to, to, to earlier stuff, so yes. And then subsequently, uh, year, uh, some years later, I guess in 1961, Benny Carter made an album called Further Definitions. Oh, yes. Uh, Coleman Hawkins was honored and so forth, and he called Phil. And that, and that date, you know, some of our people will be, some of our listeners will be familiar with. That was on Impulse Records. Great record. Amazing record. And um, that sparked a lifelong friendship for the rest of, you know, Phil was, would be close to Benny Carter for the rest of Benny Carter's life. Uh, which means another 36, 37 years. Um, they did a couple of records together for the Music Masters label, a couple of two alto records. And um, so, so, so your statement would be true. Okay. Bill, here's a question maybe you can answer from Charlie Boyle in Glasgow, Scotland, who reports, I once owned a Phil Woods tape with a burning version of the trolley song. Anyone know the name of the album and the name of the guitarist? Cheers. Does that does that ring a bell? Bell uh, trolley song. I I don't think we ever recorded that as a group, but maybe that's one of the records with uh, Jimmy Rainey. It's his earliest records with uh, Jimmy Rainey could be. We yeah. never played the trolley song, but uh, as far as I know. Okay. You know my, my memory is pretty good. You know. But, you know, we played a lot of music for a lot of years. I don't remember ever playing that tune. So, yeah. that would be my guess. I guess, uh, you know, Phil had a, you know, he had a 20-year career before I ever met him. Yeah. And, you know, he did this show on NPR, uh, you know, the uh, jazz jazz shows. Uh, what did they call it? You know, Ted. Uh, it was like uh, they, they do pro. No. It wasn't piano. We did that. We did that one. Steve and I did that with Phil. Profiles in jazz. But profiles in jazz, right? And you know, it was like a, a half hour of the show before, or forty minutes of the show before they got around to, to our group, and we'd been together thirty years at that point. <laughs> yeah. Now Gary we had quite a uh, long career. Here's an interesting comment. You know, most people, especially those out in the jazz world. No Phil from his solo on Billy Joel's Just the Way You Are. Uh, anybody have any stories about that session or if Phil got a lot of royalties from that? Ted, do you ever talk he about that? He didn't get any royalties. No royalties. Oh, boy. No, he didn't own the music. Uh, I think he just went in there and did it, you know. Well, uh, he, that's right. I can't, he I can't remember what he... He did two solos yes. that day for Phil Ramone. And one was for Billy Joel, and the other one was for Phoebe Snow. The record called uh, "Never Letting Go." Wow. He did yeah. them in about uh, about an hour and a half. He did the two the two gigs. He made about a grand, and uh, and that was that. Well, shortly before that, Phil was a very busy member of the New York studio scene. Uh, Ted, could you talk a little bit about what what what, what was the New York studio scene about? Jingles, uh, commercials, TV commercials, Madison Avenue. Uh, a lot of record re recordings were, were made. Um, so there are so many musicians in New York. Phil, I, I mentioned before that Phil had gone to Juilliard, uh, and he and he was fully exposed 
to the most contemporary um, currents in music. He describes in the book listening to John Cage and David Tudor. Uh, listen, listen to a lot of 20th century classical music. At the same time, he was playing with Charlie Barnett and touring and playing the Apollo or jamming at, uh, uh, at uh, the Paradise Lounge where Big Nick Nicholas ran the jam session. He was a fully trained musician and he, and he, as he put it, he could read fly S blank blank T. I don't know if I'm allowed to use profanity on your show. <laughs> you can use any so, fucking profanity you, you like. Okay. Well, then he could, well, well, then, Brent, he could read fly shit, okay? Yeah. As, as he put it. And he had a, 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 all this big band experience, all these chops. So he became, and, and the arrangers who were doing these uh, sessions in New York, like, I don't know, Manny Album, Al Cohn, uh, Gary McFarland, the Bill, Bill can name them be better than I can. Uh, were were incorporating uh, bebop and uh, and more modern cl classical music into their arrangements, and Phil was very well suited to play it. So he could so he could he, he could read everything down without much fuss, and he could solo, and he, he had he had both uh, qualities. So he had a very lucrative career in the studios uh, from about 1957 58 until he left for Europe. He and Chen let, picked up and left for Europe in 1968 in the wake of the assassination of Robert Kennedy and the assassination of Martin Luther King. They had a, uh, a biracial child, Baird, uh, Charlie Parker's son, Baird. Uh, they were concerned for his uh, future in racist America at the time. Uh, that, was one, that was one factor, and they transplanted to Paris, which we can talk about later. But Phil writes very vividly about his experiences in Europe uh, during the late 60s. And in one of the relationships that he developed when he got to New York was with Quincy Jones. Uh, he played in Quincy's big band and did a lot of studio work. Does Phil in the book have anything to say about Quincy? Quite a bit. He was uh, he 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 did a um, a whole recording uh, maybe twelve years ago. Bill Bill would remember this. Uh, yeah, about twelve, about ten or twelve. Quincy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yes, he, he, Quincy Jones, I, I, I can't remember exactly how they met, but Phil, was, uh, it, Phil started playing every Monday night at Birdland with Jim Chapin, a drummer, who Bill can talk about what Jim Chapin's contributions were to the drummers. He, he was a great on pedagogue as well as uh, a fine drummer. And, and through playing all these Monday nights at Birdland, Oscar Goodstein, uh, the proprietor of it kind of took him under his wing a little bit and, uh, and, and helped him out for whatever reason and got him booked on a Birdland All-Stars tour. So Phil, by 1955-56, was riding the bus with Bud Powell, Lester Young, you know, the people who would be on a Birdland tour. And um, Quincy, I think, heard him at that time. I think Quincy might have contributed an arrangement or two. I'm not, I'm not positive. But around that time, Dizzy Gillespie was forming his uh, 1950s big band for their State Department tours of the Middle East. And, uh, and um, Quincy, um, uh, and, and so Phil writes extensively in the book and uses all, no, uh, he uses writings by Bill Crow subsequently. But, uh, but, but about this tour with Dizzy Gillespie and Then Quincy Jones himself moved to uh, moved to France with a musical, uh, and uh, Phil came over and spent about a year involved in this ill-fated project that generated some very good music, but when it, but unfortunately was unable to gain traction. Uh, Quincy lost a lot of money on that, but uh, he and Phil became very close through that experience. Uh, there's 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 he, he wrote a, a good bit about that, and uh, and it's in the middle section of Life in E Flat. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to check that out. Now, Bill, Bill, do you? Bill, in addition to playing the drums, you also produced a number of Phil's recordings. How did that come about? Had you produced anything before that? Uh, that was uh, one of my er early accounts. I had been uh, had the idea in the late 70s. Uh, I was already playing with Phil, and then I had the idea that uh, I wanted to start producing. I'd get together with friends, and I'd been doing a lot of studio work and 
had engineer friends and they were, you know, willing to hang out late at night and had a few projects like that. And then I just, you know, I was doing with people. We had, uh, you know, we got studio jam jamming in the studio bands and I would organize people and we would, you know, people like in my earliest experiments were uh, like Chuck Israels, uh, Tom Harrell was involved in some of that, Harold Danko, uh, Bill Dobbins, Steve Brown. Anyway, uh, Lou Tabakin and Mike Moore and I did a whole thing, which we project, which we never sold. And, uh, you know, I was getting into it, directly influenced by my experience, early experience with uh, with Phil's group, because he had a, a manager, a producer, when uh, we got together as a group. And it seemed to me he was doing everything he could to uh, to mess us up, you know. I didn't like the guy. I didn't think he was very good as a producer. He certainly was bad as a manager. And uh, so I got this idea. We were actually on a, uh, on a record date with Phil. The first, you know, it kind of came together in my mind. The very first album I did with Phil for RCA was called the New Phil Woods album. Yeah, I remember that. And, uh, and the guy, uh, Norman Schwartz, I might as well mention his name. So I don't like to mention his name. As I, you know, but he's gone now, so I can't protest. In any case, uh, uh, he came out and started. Now, you know, I've been, you know, working at the highest level of the, the scene, you know, both in the studios and in the jazz world for like 15 years at that point. You know, it wasn't like I was some guy off the street. And Norman comes in and starts telling me how to play. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, I didn't make a scene about it, but I'm thinking to myself, like, I'm making a hundred dollars and he's making a thousand dollars and I know way more about what's going on than he does. He was an accountant. He had no musical knowledge at all. He knew how to steal though, but he was very good at that. So, uh, they just clue, you know, it just started looking for opportunities to do something. And then when, when the group fell and Phil fell out with Norman, he got wise to what his game was and he fell out with Norman and there, there we were and we had no we had no manager we had no producer we kind of became a the group became like a cottage cottage industry uh we had a booking agent uh, or two, or two and we had my sister kind of running the business you know uh, fielding the you know business calls and then i uh, volunteered to start producing and i've already been I've been recording again for myself Actually, Mike Melillo, the original pianist, and I had recorded the band a couple of times, uh, about a year apart, down in Texas, in Austin. And I had these tapes, so I went and put them together and made like two uh, two LPs and sold them for about, I don't know, a lot more than it cost to make them. I think spent about, you know, three or $400 making them and, and generated thousands of dollars, you know, for the group. So now, the little guys in the group are like, hey, Bill's, Bill's, if not a genius, he's certainly very smart. So, so I ended up with the gig. And that started in 1979. And, uh, and right, up, right up through the end. So how, how many actual recordings did you produce? Uh, I don't know. I really, I really haven't kept count. <laughs> uh, 20? And I'm funny that way. Oh, more than that. Well, I produced a lot of other records too. I pr probably produced in all a couple of hundred albums. Oh, we but, and I think uh, maybe maybe forty of them are are Phil. And which are your favorite Phil, Phil albums you produced? Oh, that's a, that's an interesting question. I like them all, but you know, you, the clip you played before that, of course, is the band that everybody still talks about. The band with Phil and Tom Harrell in the front line, and you know, Galper Gilmore and and me, the High G's, we were known as. Uh, reputedly because we're so tall. Uh, now, uh, I think the, <laughs> me, th thank you. I mean, me personally, I like the, uh, well, the, the Quincy Jones record, which is a expanded, that's like a, a nine, nine piece record. Uh, this, this is how I feel about Quincy. Phil reduced, uh, Phil reduced the big band charts to a nine piece format and without losing anything at all it's a wonderful record i'm very proud of uh, my work on it which was you know when you're 
when you're dealing with like somebody like Phil Woods and the guys in that group, man, it's such an easy gig. <laughs> All you got to do is just show up and have an idea about what it's supposed to sound like, and uh, and there you have it. So I like I really like that one a lot. I like the uh, other little big band. Uh, uh, first one for Concord, which is called uh, Evolution. That's another really good record that I'm really proud of. Uh, that one particularly because we did it uh, direct to two track, old school, you know, direct to two track tape, pre digital. The great Jim Anderson engineering. So I can't say enough good things about Jim. Yeah. But I always worked with uh, with really good engineers, and we, you know, we loved uh, doing the music, and it was easy to easy to work with. Musicians who are that good, you certainly don't have to tell them how to play. You know, you might make a suggestion or two, you know, about doing another take or, you know, uh, tuning up or, you know, just little, little details. That's but fun. I was good at I was good at that. I was good at that, and I was good at uh, I was negotiated most of the record deals. You know, and uh, hey, man, you know, I'm a high school dropout, but I can I can read a contract and I under, and I know the music business so like it used to be no nothing's like it used to be uh you know some musicians sure. some musicians and I, when i when i mention this i speak of uh a man that uh ted and i know both very well and that's sonny rollins sonny rollins uh he's not playing anymore but in the time that i worked I with him he hated to go into the studio you know it was, it was like I, I saw him in the studio a couple of times he did not want to be there he felt that his best work was done live. In fact, a number of uh, his later recordings were live recordings. How did Phil feel about being in the studio? Bill. Oh, he was comfortable. He was comfortable in the studio. Obviously, you know, as a master of the master of the the, music, the scene. But as uh, I find, if you look at the discography, uh, you'll find that probably half of, or close to half of the records uh, that I produced for Phil were recorded live. And a lot of them recorded like direct to stereo, you know, and uh, as uh, minimal, with as minimal minimal miking and minimal effects, and you know, it's like old school, old school. But I understand that uh, Sonny had a real aversion to being in the studio; that he wouldn't even stick around for a mixing or or any of that. That he would leave that to Lucille, his wife. Yeah, that was uh, Ted. Did you ever talk to Sonny about that? Uh, earlier, in his, he said that that developed, I think, in res somewhat in response to the uh, multi-tracking technology with, you know, being able to go back and edit and sort of this uh, <coughs> quest for perfection. Because he said, well, I, I obviously didn't have a problem in the studio in the 1950s or early 1960s. So it developed, uh, it developed at a certain point. That's all he said to me about it. Yeah. Um, uh, he, I don't know. I, I still I, there's still a number. Of, anyway, this is about Phil Woods and not Sonny Rollins. Which, That's true. That's but, true. Um, but so but I, I do have. I, 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 but I did have a, an experience watching Phil and the band in the studio in 2008. With, oh uh, really? With, with the great band that he had for maybe 13, 14 years, with Bill Charlotte playing piano alongside Brian Lynch, who played trumpet with Phil for. Oh, long, 1992 to 2015, so for 22 years, uh, and Steve Gilmore and Bill, and uh, it, it's the it, it generated the album American Songbook Number no. Two, which is one of my favorite records by Phil, and um, it, it was very relaxed. And what I noticed about it is that everything seemed to be almost one take, max two, and it was just masterful. Every every tune came out about six or seven minutes. It was creative. Uh, the arrangements were run down sort of orally. I, I guess there was sheet music. I don't remember, but uh, but it was just it was just total master class. Five grandmasters of music uh, creating, and uh, Phil's personality. Phil Phil didn't have to say very much to get his point across to that particular group. I, I, I and that's an album I I'm, I'm particularly fond of. Uh, both big from having been there, but also it's, it's, one of, it's one of them that I've listened to, you know, multiple times. Now, Bill, you worked uh, with Phil for many years. Uh, what, was, what was life on the road like with Phil? 
Oh, I don't know. I, I never spoke to him, really. Actually, uh, you know, I kept my distance. No, I'm kidding. Uh, it was fine. It was fine. You know, I spent 50, I spent most of my spent most of my career on the road. So uh, being on the road with Phil had his ups and downs, like it does with anybody else. Uh, but the great thing about being on the road with Phil was that you'd get to play together, you know, <laughs> a lot. And you know that was the that was the attraction. I mean, at, at one point after uh, Steve Gilmore and I had been in the band for about five or six years, we were talking, and you know, I knew I'd been playing with Steve for a few years before we met, before we Phil came into our life. So we were like a team, like before that, and we came in kind of as a, a section, you know, uh, together. I mean, I brought him in because you know he was the right guy. It's obvious, you know, and. Uh, so uh, we just started talking about, you know, doing other things. You know, you get that urge. Well, we've been doing this for five or six years. Well, we should be doing something else. And we decided it wasn't going to ever get any better than the, this musically, that we should just stick with it. And the next thing you knew, it was like 20 and then 30 and ended up being 41 years, the three of us. Wow. You guys really locked up. When you play that much together, there's like a symbiotic, uh, nonverbal communication that happens when you play. It's remarkable. Yeah, well, that was that's the attraction, right? Well, yeah. It's sort of like, like uh, you know, uh, uh, and not animal magnetism. Maybe it's something to do with that. I'll tell you something, man. I, you know, and I may have mentioned it the other day when we were chatting that I played with Phil. I can remember the last time we played together, we did a live record at the Deerhead Inn. And uh, it's our last last recording. We did live at the Deerhead Inn. And I, we hadn't played at all that year. We played like one gig or something. Played on the cruise. And we came in and we uh, ran a couple of tunes down. And as soon as Phil started playing, it was like, damn, that guy sure plays good. This is like after 40 years, you know. Yeah. Never got tired of playing with them. Never got tired of it. It was always, always exciting, always fun. A lot of humor, a lot of, uh, jo you know, in inside jokes. A lot, of, a lot of water under that bridge. Yeah, here's a question from Richard Northleys. He wants to know, did you both play with Hal Crook in Phil's Quintet back in the 90s? Yeah. Well, Bill did. I didn't. No, just joking. <laughs> <laughs> So it was a Hal Crook on when, uh, Hal Crook on trombone. The pants, then. <laughs> so, yeah, that was a great band. That's actually uh, one of my favorite uh, my favorite quintet records. There may be from that period. We had Hal Crook and Jim McNeely. Oh yeah, for about two years together in the band in the early '90s, and we had a fair amount of work. It wasn't real steady, but we had a fair amount, and we made a couple of nice records. We made our first kind of. Uh, standards record that we'd ever made which was uh, for a japanese uh, company and we did uh, movie songs and it's called uh, you and the night and the music i think is the uh, one of the titles i'm not sure there was two different several different titles on it then we did a live at catalina's in la with uh, with that band oh the galper was on the movie one and then mcneely replaced him and uh and we recorded at Catalina's in L.A. for the album for uh, one album we did for Milestone uh, Records, which was called Full House. Yeah. And that is a bad that is a badass record. And Hal Crook and Phil together was just something else, man. That that sound was really compelling. I, was, I really loved it. And McNeely was fabulous. Great, great tunes, great arrangements. There's a tune of McNeely's on there called uh, Empty House. So they paraphrased that to make the we couldn't call the al the album Empty House, you know. So we called it Full House, and we had the uh, added a, a wondrous experience of having uh, uh, Bill Claxton shoot the cover photo, and uh, so it was like my whole West Coast jazz dream came true, you know. Yeah. Now Roger Leventhal says, "Love Phil, Live at the Showboat is a masterpiece. Why is that album so far?" So hard to find. Didn't it win a Grammy? Do you remember that one, Bill? Live at the Showboat. Yeah, that was a, yeah, 19, 1976. Yeah, we won a Grammy, and uh, six months out, and we won a Record of the Year in Time Magazine. That was all genre of music. That wasn't just jazz. 
one of the top five records of the year. And uh, it was an RCA record produced by Norman Schwartz, which uh, about three months after we got the Grammy, they dropped, they dropped us from the label. But they dropped all of Norman's acts because they found out that he was stealing from them. So that was the, uh, the, the trouble with that. But, you know, you can find it. I have a copy. You can find it. It probably costs a lot of money, you know, if you get it on vinyl. It was re-released on CD as under some name. Uh, John, John Snyder did the reissue of the CD uh, issue on it and ended up leaving out about uh, several of Phil's most important copyrights. Phil was not happy about it. Yeah. But, you know, that's the, that's the biz. Yeah, that's, that's the, biz. the biz. You know, I... I I think it's a good record. The band sounds it, it, it really jacked up and edgy, and uh, uh, it had some could have been some substances involved. And uh, plus, they had a Brazilian percussionist that Norman wanted to add to the band, which he really didn't add too much on when he would uh, you know chime in on the straight ahead tunes and get uh, a loud cowbell or something. <laughs> nice guy. Though. Oh, here's another comment. Oh, really? From, Come on, man. <laughs> another comment from Richard. He says, you wouldn't want to get on Phil's bad side. I've seen him lash <laughs> out, and it wasn't pretty. He was an old-school New Englander, and if you upset him, he could give you a serious tongue lashing. Did you ever get a tongue lashing from Phil Woods, Bill? Listen, I can, I can take it, and I can give it out. <laughs> but, you know, I never, I never hit him in the mouth. That's good. Ted, Ted you, some of your early experiences with Phil, wasn't there a, a, a problem with something you wrote or something that appeared in Downbeat? <laughs> well, <laughs> there were, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of miraculous that Phil wound up asking me to work on this with him. Um, my first encounter with him uh, was in the 80s. I was at the time working on a, trying to work on an ill-fated um, uh, history of, Black Jazz in Chicago in the 1980s, and I wanted to interview Bud Johnson. And Bud Johnson, I lived in Greenwich Village uh, for many years, and, at the t and Bud Johnson was playing at Sweet Basil, a club on Bleecker and 7th Avenue South. So I was walking home from the Village Vanguard, and I noticed I'd probably had maybe one drink too many, and I saw Bud Johnson sitting in the window. I knew he was playing there. And I just decided to go in. And there was a uh, you know middle-aged white guy with a mustache and a, maybe a leather jacket and a cap sitting next to him. And this gentleman told me to get the f out of out of there before he took matters into his own hands. And Bud Johnson, who had apparently quite a temper himself, was calming him down. Now that turned out to be Bill Woods. So I, 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 I went home uh, licking my wounds. I hate this guy. I hate. I, um, and that was, that was basically that for a number of years, and uh, maybe, I don't know, 15, 18 years after that, Downbeat was doing a 70th anniversary issue. Um, 25 saxophonists on their, uh, on, their, on, on, their great, on their greatest influence, and I had, um, somebody already had Charlie Parker, so when I called Phil, I thought he'd want to talk about Benny Carter, who I knew was a big influence on him. But Phil wanted to talk about Harvey LaRose, which was admirable. I mean, he was extremely loyal. But I didn't think that my editor or publisher would want to publish Phil talking about Harvey LaRose. But I said, let's do it. And sure enough, they did, Downbeat did not want to, uh, did not want to run it. Uh, they tasked me with delivering that news to Phil. Uh, Phil was not happy. He sent out to his entire uh, email serve list announcing me and Downbeat, uh, kind of a prelude to uh, a Twitter blast, you know, like from, uh, you know, uh, on someone who's politically uh, opposed to you if you're, in, in any event, uh, Frank Alkire from Downbeat did diplomatic triage, and I think um, maybe a couple of the guys in Phil's band who were Friends of mine may have told him to calm it down, and he sent out an email saying that I was a good guy and it was okay. Then a couple of years later, Downbeat asked me to write a... So those were my experiences with... Uh, a couple of years later, I um, was assigned by Downbeat to write a cover story about Phil. I'm not sure around what, around what record, around maybe American Songbook 1. In any event, so I went to see him. Uh, we, we made an arrangement to meet 
at the IAJE conference in New York in January 2007. And he was being interviewed by his old friend, Matt Hentoff, during a public interview. A huge crowd. Phil told a lot of the, you know, he, he told a lot of stories, the same stories, and, he had, and he, he had practiced them. A number of those stories are in this book, and his readers may, you know, may know them. I tried to... Oh. Uh, can you hear me? You, you froze up for a second. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're having so we're having we're we're having some some bad connections here today. It, uh, I, oh, I'm moving now though. Good. I'm moving now. Pick it up. Okay, I, I, I'll try not to be too too long winded. Where did um, so he was being interviewed by Nat Hentoff. Did he? Did we get that? Yeah. Public. All right. So at the end of it, uh, then we were supposed to meet in his hotel room. Uh, Hentoff was interviewing him in the Sheridan Hotel at 54 and 6th. He was staying in the Hilton at 53rd and 6th. So we had to cross the street. And as we left the room, Phil all of a sudden got pale. Uh, and he was starting to have trouble. I can see he was struggling, having trouble breathing. It's like he looked waxen, like he wasn't getting oxygen. And we made our way across the street to his hotel room. I was kind of worried uh, about him. And of course, being a writer about my story, what would happen if, you know, I'm, I'm joking. I'm kind of joking about that. And he, he got to his <laughs> hotel room and he um, hooked himself up to his oxygenator and, he, and then he was fine. And we spoke for about two hours. Uh, at the end of that, I told him about my previous experiences with him and he cracked up. Um, then a couple of years later, uh, he asked me to, he called me, and I think I ran into him at Birdland. I went to see the band. He mentions, he asked if he could call me, and then he called me, and he asked me if I'd work with him on putting together his autobiography, because Phil had been writing for years, probably since the 90s, uh, in uh, various vignettes and, uh, and essays in, around... Uh, Locally, mostly, right, Bill, around the Delaware Water Gap and in, and in different places, and to his fan group, and he pres and he had a yeah, manuscript. Some, yeah. Go ahead, Bill. Well, he he used to write a a column for the uh, Note, which was the uh, the little newspaper that was uh, edited by Flo Cohn, as Al Cohn's wife, and uh, and it started as a little uh, you know fold over. Uh, uh, ta you know, tabloid, sort of like the you know high tower, low down kind of thing. You know, a few pages. Uh, you know, and uh, evolved into a you know uh, a glossy magazine that's now put out by the East Strasburg University, which houses wow. the Alcone uh, li Alcone Library. Okay. So he used to have the column. It was on the front page of the note. It was called "Fill in the Gap." Because he lived, huh. uh, you know, in the water, Delaware Water Gap, so fill in the gap, and I used to refer to it as the ravings of a madman. Uh, but uh, to, uh, to uh, much hilarity all around. Yeah, of course. But he was a good, you know, it, it, good, it, it, talented, talented writer. Very, you know, uh, very good, uh, very good with language. You know, uh, not necessarily uh, syntax and or punctuation, but boy, well, he had a lot of. Uh, a lot of writerly qualities. Absolutely. He was very honest. Oh, I'm sorry, Brett. We're, it's, it's three o'clock. I know we probably have to wrap up. Yeah, we're gonna be we're gonna wrap it up here as we, as we burn through an hour very quickly. Obviously, there's a lot more to be said about Phil Woods. I hope that uh, some of you will actually pick up the book, Life in E Flat. Get the book, which uh, Ted did a fantastic job with, and uh, I've enjoyed reading it myself. And, uh, well, let let me say that I didn't really, um, the, the language is Phil's. I, I did a lot of editing. We also did uh, on various subjects after he asked me to work on it, and I interpolated his, his commentary, hopefully pretty seamlessly, into the text. So I just want to reiterate that I, that I didn't write this book. I, I served as an editor, co-author, but Phil, the writing is Phil. Phil Wood, is Phil Woods. Sorry, Brett. Yeah, well, I, I just want to say your, uh, your foreword, which is like opening the book with a, the epilogue, was very beautiful, man. Very moving. Great piece of writing. Thank you. 
Yeah, Ted's one of my favorite writers when it comes to jazz. No doubt about he's, that. He's, he's darn good. Yeah, that's why he has the respect of so many musicians, I'm sure. Uh, and I'll, I'll, you could send me that check when the show's over, Ted. Um, <laughs> so let's close out here. Uh, yeah, is that it? To you? <laughs> Bill, you're not playing with Phil anymore. I know you're living above the deer head in Delaware Gap. What else are you doing these days? Well, I'm teaching at William Patterson University. Uh, I've been there for 20 years now. This is my 21st year. And I'm, uh, you know, making some records of my own records, uh, doing a little bit of, little bit of producing, and uh, been involved in starting up the Deerhead record label about uh, five or six, seven years ago, something like that. But I'm keeping my hand in, I'm practicing every day, not playing, not playing a lot, but I'm practicing a lot, and you know, waiting out the uh, the plague. Yes, aren't we all? And Ted, uh, now that this book is done, aside from your usual. Uh, work uh, with Downbeat and other publications. Are you planning any other books? I have a number of ideas in mind, but um, none of them is coalescing into anything concrete right now. But I do have, you know, several thoughts and I uh, have to see if anyone wants to publish it or maybe Mr. Gary will. That's right. Remember, uh, maybe Gary. St maybe maybe I'll talk with Gary Stager about some other ideas. But Gary's note is important. Bill Sharlap and Brian Lynch both contributed wonderful essays to the uh, to Phil Wood's autobiography, uh, Life in E Flat, Symbol Press. Absolutely. So, I want to thank uh, Ted and Bill for joining me today. We had some technical issues, such as the nature of uh, this medium. Yeah. Uh, it's still amazing, though, that we can uh, get together like this. And, uh, I mean, I've been a Phil Woods... Actually, I think I first heard Phil Woods on a Quincy Jones record in 1962. I've always been a fan of his since. And uh, highly recommend uh, Life in E-Flat. Uh, great book about a, a fascinating man. And if you don't know Phil's music, uh, please go out and uh, listen, to, uh, listen to him play because that uh, is something we can treasure forever. So thanks for joining us for another edition of Jazz Video Guy Live. Uh, I want to thank my guest, Bill Goodwin and Ted Pankin. And next week, my special guest will be Ben Sidron. So everyone, please stay safe, stay healthy, and keep listening to jazz.